I'll turn it over to Dave uh, for our final presentation on property taxes. So property tax, the tax everyone loves to hate. I thought we'd start with some, some two pieces of good news. First, this is the last presentation, and it's the shortest presentation. So that's the good news about property tax. Um, I'll start with uh, the difference between state and local. Most property tax is local. Uh, only about 15% of the dollars that are collected are, are state, uh, and that is from two sources. The bulk of it is 20 mills that's mandatorily charged for support of schools, and then there's one and a half mills that is for the state building fund, which, and that's largely higher ed. Uh, the rest of the taxes are charged by various forms of local government. It's cities, counties, school districts, uh, library districts in some counties and so forth. This is the breakout. You can see that 47% is the biggest piece. That's cities and counties and townships. 26% uh, of the taxes is K-12. That's LOB, capital outlay, uh, bond and interest debt that they've incurred mostly. Uh, and then 15% state, then there's some other little pieces in there as well. Uh, total property tax uh, in 2017 was $4.7 billion. Uh, roughly $4 billion of that is real estate tax, and about $750 million that's personal property tax. And most of what's in personal property is uh, state assessed. That's uh, utilities and uh, railroads. So the bulk of the property tax is real estate. Real estate taxes uh, have gone up 195% uh, since 1997. A uh, little bit of difference here between assessment, how, how the taxes get charged. Our constitution in Kansas uh, has two, well, they have several, but the, the two big ones here that we'll talk about, the assessment ratios. So residential property is assessed at 11.5% of its appraised value. So if they appraise a house at $100,000, the tax that's going to get charged is going to be based on $11,500 worth of uh, assessed valuation. Commercial and industrial property, on the other hand, is taxed at or assessed at 25% of appraised value. So that's one of the that's one of the big reasons that Kansas, compared to other states, has some of the highest uh, effective property tax rates on commercial industrial uh, property. And I don't rem Eric may have mentioned this, but uh, it's in the Lincoln Land Institute uh, report at the back of our 2018 grand, uh, Green Book. Uh, the highest effective property tax rate in rural areas in the country is in Iola, Kansas. So if, you're, if you live in rural areas and you're wondering why, it's because Kansas, because, and it's a lot of that is, it's, it's a double factor, it's the assessment ratio and then it's the mill rates that are charged and we'll get to that into a minute. Uh, effective tax rates, uh, urban residential, uh, number 28, you can see those, um, how Kansas ranks um, on some of those, and there's a lot more of information that, on that in the 2018 Green Book. I um, want to talk about the voter law that's been in effect now, actually in effect for about a year. Uh, it's called a property tax lid. That's an inaccurate description. Uh, it's a property tax trigger. Uh, a lid would imply that it can't go beyond this. What Kansas has in place is a law that says for local government, cities and counties, to take it beyond a certain level, which is an inflationary increase, they need a vote, uh, public approval. So it's not a lid. It can go higher, but be, to take it beyond uh, inflation, they have to get your permission to do that. Uh, and and when that's talking about the ta tax dollars on uh, with a lot of exceptions. So uh, the law excludes money from new construction. It excludes spending on a variety of different kind of spending. Um, and, and so it's a really watered down property tax trigger. Uh, and, and yet it's, uh, it was, uh, it, it did, there were a few tests. Uh, I know one that passed and one that failed and they're really small towns. So don't test my memory on, on which ones they were. Um, why do voters want, why did voters demand the legislature pass some kind of protection? Why is it the most hated tax? Well, here's an example. In Sedgwick County, and this is one of the good examples, property tax revenue is up 95% since 1997. 
uh, where inflation is 47 percent, and in Sedgwick County, there's been a 17 percent increase in population. So if you put the inflation and population together, you've got about a 64 percent increase. So you could see maybe if property taxes were going up 64 percent, but not 95 percent. Now let's uh, let's look at how other counties compare. Uh, well, City of Wichita, 107 percent increase. Butler County, 199 percent increase. Anybody here from Andover? Now, again, Andover's had a lot of population increase, but 500% increase in property tax. So when government likes to say, we haven't raised your property tax, they're only talking about the mill rate. There's two ways that your tax goes up. One is the assessed valuation, and the other is the mill rate. So when you're seeing these kinds of examples, uh, Reno County, for example, uh, Paul's back there from uh, Reno County, 209%. So they should be reducing, you, you know, the, what they really should be doing to be more taxpayer friendly is reduce the mill rate. So if you've got a 47% increase in inflation and population, you don't need a 209% tax increase. That's just choice. And the way these budgets get put together is local governments decide what they're going to spend, and then they look at how much did valuations raise the property tax, and what will we get from the mill rate? Do we need to increase the mill rate in order to spend what we want to spend? It's not the reverse process. It's not a matter of what do we need to spend. Are we effective like we talked about performance-based budgeting? That doesn't enter into it. Uh, so why do property taxes increase so much? Well, it's the spending. Uh, again, it's the only thing that determines how much a government taxes is how much it chooses to spend. So in this 20-year period, and this is census data, uh, there's been 51 percent uh, inflationary increase, but local government spending in Kansas went up 124 percent. So two and a half times inflation. What's another reason it might go up? Well, we are the second worst state in the nation for local government employees per capita. Some of that's because we have a lot of government. We have a lot more, you know, on a kind of a per resident basis, a lot more cities, counties, and townships. Um, we also have a lot of other types of government. We have a lot of government employees. At the national average uh, per capita, Kansas would have 38,000 fewer local government employees if we were at the national average of local government employees per capita. So, those spending increases and a lot of local government employees, that's why your property taxes are so high. And I told you this would be the shortest presentation uh, of the day, and that's it. Joseph Tex, Dozier, JTD Strategies. I'm a little naive when it still comes to Kansas policy, but property taxes, I just moved here from Texas, and uh, property tax reform is top of the ticket for voters in Texas, but we seem to not be able to do anything, even protection, with our super majority Republican legislature. And one of the things that we put forward, and I'm, I'm curious how it works here in Kansas, is going to this lid. The, um, that's on an actual tax raise, while in Texas our problem is appraisal values go up 36% over four years. Um, so the appraisal values go up, the tax rates never go down, and in Texas we have had huge debates about a rollback rate triggering an election to do a rollback election. Um, and mainly that's centered on what would that rate be and, and how do the citizens then get that ballot election to occur. Uh, is there a rollback rate in Kansas? Is there uh, centering around appraisals? Is there any discussion about doing that for uh, voter protection and at mm -hmm. what level? Yeah, those great questions. There, there has been discussion, and, and hopefully there'll be more discussion on because we still the, the voter trigger law that was passed um, uh, helps, but it's it was watered down so much that it's it's de minimis help. We need a lot more, and, and so there's, there's, we're, we're trying to uh, promote a lot of discussion on uh, some of the various options, including some of the ones you mentioned. The way this works in Kansas is that it's on uh, the valuation, it's the two parts, the valuation and the mill rate. And so the measurement is not on the valuation, it's on the tax dollars generated. So it doesn't matter whether it comes from mill rate or evaluation, 
if the dollars you're going to spend on property t- from property tax revenue exceeds inflation with the exceptions, that triggers the requirement for a public vote. Okay. Any last questions? Paul, oh, yes. You know, I've seen uh, Paul Wagner's questions in one of the four. The, uh, I, I, I've seen the data you guys have generated on the, or in the, from some other source on Kansas having like 630 employees for 100,000 people or whatever, which the national average will be more around 400. Has anybody like really broken down that exactly how Kansas is literally that much higher than everybody else? I mean, I mean, what, what, what is driving that? I mean, is it? Um, you know, small town governments, is it townships, is it what? Uh, it, it's, a, it's kind of an all of the above answer, Paul. Uh, uh, it, there's a, uh, in the Green Book, there's a breakout of uh, 50 states, all 50 states on general purpose governments, um, which are cities, counties, and townships. Uh, Kansas has uh, about 2,000 residents per general purpose government. The national average is over 8,000 residents. And what that means is we have four to five times as many local units of government. Uh, it's, it's most of that's in the townships. Uh, some of that's in the counties. Again, we have 105 counties in Kansas. Anyone know why we have 105 counties? Senator? Going to get to the courthouse on horseback or in the wagon. That man wins the prize. County courthouse had to be one day's ride, no more. That's why we have 105 counties. No good reason. Uh, it's just that's the way it is. Uh, Florida, uh, 67 counties. We have 105. Florida has millions more people than we do. So there's lots of ways it can be done, but that's it, it Paul. It's, it's a combination of we have more counties. We have more, uh, a lot more townships and other types of, of government. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dave. Okay, thanks. And thank you uh, to everyone for sticking around, uh, grinding it out with us. Hopefully you've left or will leave shortly with a better understanding of the issues, whether you agree with KPI or the chamber or anybody else. Uh, Hopefully, you've been challenged in some of your thinking. You've been given a resource to ask better questions. Uh, one of the last slides is where you can find some of those additional resources. In the back, again, we have publications that have been referenced throughout from us, the chamber. Uh, Walt Chapel's here this evening. He brought something uh, that's also available at the back table. This is an opportunity for us, regardless of what the constraints are on the data, if it's good or bad, it's the data that we have available. And we can't make decisions about what we should do as priorities for this state without having that available. So thank you very, very much for coming today, or this evening rather. Thanks for grinding it out to the end with us. Have a good evening and we will uh, talk to you soon.